Hey everyone, I'm Mark, and if you want to understand a little bit more about how things like DLSS, frame generation, and lossless scaling can improve your experience in Flight Sim, then this video is going to be for you because we're going to look at what each of them is for, some of the pros and cons, what hardware you need for them to work, and in what situations you should consider using them. This won't be a step-by-step -step guide to setting each of these up, though. It's more of an explainer on what each of them does and how it can potentially be useful to you. But a lot of this is going to be system dependent and it'll come down to personal preference on what compromises you're willing to make. The first thing that we're going to look at are the DLSS anti-aliasing options. And to understand what those are, let's start by looking at the fundamental problem that it helps to solve. What you're seeing when you look at Flight Sim is really just a series of frames one after the other and anti-aliasing is a technique that helps improve the look of jagged lines rendered on screen which are especially noticeable on diagonal or curved edges. Flight Sim lets you pick which anti-aliasing you want to use with TAA probably being the most common but if you have a 20 series and up NVIDIA RTX card you also have access to DLSS anti-aliasing which isn't as heavy as TAA is to compute but it does come at the cost of some visual clarity. When you choose DLSS as the anti-aliasing engine in Flight Sim, you'll have to choose between one of a few different options with DLAA being slightly different from the others. DLAA works in a similar enough way to TAA with the exception that it runs a deep learning model to perform the anti-aliasing instead and when it comes to the actual world itself it does a pretty good job of it. The other DLSS options so quality, balanced performance and ultra performance use the same anti-aliasing engine as DLAA but it takes it a step further and it performs the anti-aliasing at a lower resolution than what your screen is set to and then upscales each frame to the native resolution that you're running flight sim at. That can directly translate into better performance with your FPS, but the deep learning model isn't quite as good at anti-aliasing things like glass displays, so it can cause a bit of blurriness or ghosting on digital instruments. In terms of image quality, DLAA is the clearest of the bunch since it doesn't do the upscaling that the other options do, but as you can see, it's still got a bit of ghosting to it on glass instruments, and you can mitigate that a little bit actually by just zooming in on the instrument a bit more. All the other DLSS options will be less taxing on your GPU though, and the quality option is going to give you the clearest upscaled image possible with the ultra performance option being on the other end of the spectrum and it'll be the least heavy on your GPU, but it's really not going to look that great. The whole point of DLSS is to make anti-aliasing a less heavy operation to perform, but if you're CPU limited like I am here, you likely won't see a huge improvement from it. But on the other hand, if you're GPU limited instead, that's where you stand to get the most gain from it. Now by default, Flight Sim comes with an older version of DLSS, however you can update it to the latest version yourself by using a tool called DLSS Swapper, and like that you'll be able to access the latest and greatest from DLSS 4. Within a single DLSS version, there are also different presets that you can use that are optimized for different scenarios, and there are a few extra steps that you need to do to enable it from within the NVIDIA app, and I'll have a link to a how-to on doing just that in the description. For most people though, the display ghosting is a no-go and they end up switching back to TAA for that reason. However, I still think there are a couple scenarios that it makes more sense to use DLSS. The first of those is that if you mostly fly steam gauge planes, DLSS can work out pretty good since there's no digital displays in them that can cause ghosting. And if you have an older GPU, it'll definitely help you get better performance. Also, if you don't fly on instruments and the exact details of the numbers don't matter as much to you, again, either the DLSS quality or the DLAA options can be a good choice if you prefer its anti-aliasing, but it really comes down to personal preference. DLSS can also be really helpful if you fly in VR, which is heavy even on a top-end system, so DLSS can make it easier to achieve decent frame rates there, but again, you're often dealing with slightly blurry displays, so it's really best to try it and see what you are comfortable with.
The other thing that often gets lumped into DLSS is frame generation, which is only available on the 40 series cards as well. However, there is a mod that you can install that'll allow you to enable frame generation in Flight Sim on older RTX cards. What it does is it swaps out NVIDIA's native frame generation for AMD's FSR3 frame generation instead, so you get a similar enough benefit to the 40 series cards. Frame generation involves taking two frames that are going to be rendered on screen and creating a third frame that gets slotted in between the two original frames, theoretically doubling the frame rate that you're getting. The downside is that now 50% of your frames are being created by the deep learning model, which can sometimes cause its own type of artifacting on screen, especially on animations like jet engines or propellers. It also introduces a little bit of latency or lag, but for the most part, it's not really noticeable and it works pretty well on lower spec GPUs as well, like the 3070 that I used to have, especially if you update it to the latest version of frame generation with DLSS Swapper. Frame generation also uses more VRAM, not a ton more from what I've seen, but enough that if you're running a GPU with 8 gigabytes or less, you can run into trouble with some of the more detailed airliners. That's why in some cases it's actually better to keep frame generation off, but it's best to check it for yourself by bringing up the developer tools and displaying the FPS overlay, which will give you all of the details you need to evaluate how it's working on your system. You can see how it affects your FPS, but also have a look at the GPU and CPU memory. And it's okay to dip into the yellow, but if they're regularly going into the orange, you're close to running out of resources and that's where stutters start to happen. For GA planes, you likely won't run into any issues, but if you're flying an airliner with detailed textures like the A380 or any of the Phoenix lineup, you can quickly consume most of your VRAM, so it's worth experimenting with frame gen on and off to see if there's any improvement. What I started doing is keeping track of what combination of settings that I use from plane to plane, including the anti-aliasing, frame gen, and the terrain level of detail and object level of detail, since you can often bump them up a lot more with a smaller, less complex plane. The new 50 series GPUs are said to have multi-frame generation, which can triple or even quadruple your FPS. And although I don't have a 50 series card, I just don't see how that won't create even more artifacting, but feel free to let me know in the comments if I'm wrong about that. Now, even if you don't have an RTX card that supports frame gen, you aren't completely out of luck because there's a tool available on Steam for $8 that can bring you its own version of frame generation. Lossless scaling has been around for a while, originally just like the name says, to do upscaling, but the reason it's gotten lots of attention lately is because it's also added support for its own type of frame generation. The major difference is it runs a lot later in the process and it works at the display level instead, which actually makes it hard to capture its output, so right now we're not looking at lossless scaling rendered footage. The benefits are very clearly there though, and the two situations that I recommend it is if you have an older card that can't do native frame gen, or if you're not comfortable doing the manual process that's required to enable Nvidia's frame gen on the 20 and 30 series cards, this is going to be an easier option for you. You might have to play around a bit with the settings to get good results, but there are tons of threads on the forums and videos on YouTube specifically for flight sim usage with it that you're bound to find the right settings to work well for you. If you'd like to see more videos like this where we deep dive into some of the settings and their impacts on flight sim, make sure to let me know in the comments and like and subscribe on your way out so that you don't miss out on the next one.